So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to welcome all of you to our today's uh, meeting, I would say. Uh, we live in an unusual time, and of course, uh, nobody knows what the next thing will be. Uh, glad that we took the opportunity to join us with this event because, no question, uh, the outcome of the American elections will have a heavy influence to everything on the world, to the further development, whether this is in the States or whether this is in Europe or in China or anywhere. I do not want uh, to to uh, name our guests uh, personally. I'm just happy uh, to have diplomats and, uh, and academics around here. Long time, I from Tanya, uh, long time ambassador to, from Iran to the United uh, Nations in the Special Public Energy Agency, and also, of course, uh, members of the Austrian diplomacy. Uh, after welcome to you. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce a man who uh, will be our guest speaker today. It's Jan Sulger, uh to my left or to my right, uh, depends on um, the point of view. So, Jan Surajak was born in 1963 in Pennsylvania, USA, and he has uh, so I background his grandmother uh, came from over there, knows his name, uh, tells it a little bit. He is a true Euro-American analyst, strategist, and relations manager. Uh, he studied, on the one hand, in his, uh, near his hometown in the University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, but he also was uh, at a Fulbright Fellowship uh, to the University in Kiel in Germany, therefore he also speaks uh, very good German. Uh, he has not practiced it very much in the last three years, but uh, afterwards you also can maybe ask you one or the other question. Yeah, already from the beginning, uh, because he got also his uh, master degree of Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, one of the most prominent uh, Diplomatic schools in the States. And uh, immediately thereafter, uh, he became an analysis. And already in his first, the first phase of his work, uh, when he worked together uh, with the new political parties, especially in Central Europe, uh, he made an analysis uh, why he lost and how and why they could win. And this is also the question we want to ask him uh, due to the American situation. Uh, he became the assistant, legislative assistant of Congressman Don Ritter and worked for the Institute of, for Foreign uh, Policy Analysis and some foundations and so on. And in 1994, he joined the International Republican Institute uh, worked many, many years uh, in Europe. Therefore, he really knows, uh, especially Central Europe, maybe better than most of uh, the Europeans. Uh, and of course, also was in touch with his home country. And uh, okay, he became regional director, he became the director, had uh, the lead for political relationship with European parties, uh, and at the end, he became the senior director for transatlantic strategy. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to welcome Jan Sorenchak, who just landed a few days ago, uh, came back, and so far he can tell us, uh, not only by theory, but also by his, his own uh, practice and experience of what is going on uh, in the United States. And my first question just would be, uh, yeah, how is the situation in the United States a few weeks 
uh, before the election. And especially the question, because uh, Joe Biden is leading, I'll say five, six percent, maybe even more. Nobody knows exactly, but this is what constantly is reported. Yeah, why and how can President Trump still win the elections? Thanks, Good enough. Um, I, it, it's such an effusive introduction, I don't actually know what more to say, uh, other than um, to say that I can ever say for when I get in the can, I have here in the Gegend in the Tunisian Kasse for vielen, vielen, vielen Jahren gewohnt, um, nicht so sehr lange, aber ein Semester, und um, bin immer sehr froh, wenn ich wieder in Wien sein kann. Also vielen Dank für die Einladung. Sehr schön, um wieder da zu sein. Um, <coughs> uh, maybe just one quick uh, intro note. I, you know, I, should, I think I should be very clear from the outset that the organization that I work for um, <coughs> and have worked for the, for the past uh, 24 years, as Mayor um, uh, neatly laid out, um, is a non nonprofit, nonpartisan organization under American law. So I cannot and will not and would not um, take any position um, on the candidates in the election tonight. I view my role um, in this environment, <clears throat> particularly uh, in the relationship between the United States and Europe, um, to help my European friends and colleagues uh, understand a little bit about what is going on on the ground uh, in the US. Um, I will tell you that we'll Last election in 2016, um, I found myself on the morning after, um, which I think was November 7th of 2016, if I remember correctly, um, in a <clears throat> group of uh, representatives of Christian Democrats, center right parties from around Europe, um, organized by the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung. Uh, and the level of shock um, that went through that group of people on November 7th, 2016 is something that I want none of my European friends ever to have to relive um, because I was afraid some of them might actually have heart attacks. Um, and so some I think of what I've been doing in the years since then, the three and a half years since then, is trying um, to help, again, my European friends uh, understand a little bit of the trends that we see uh, in the United States. So let me just talk a little bit about those and then use that as a way better to get to your question. <clears throat> I think as we look across the entire transatlantic space, <clears throat> the United States, Canada, Mexico, to a lesser extent, but still included uh, South America, and then the entire European continent, um, we see that um, the political party systems uh, that we have worked to build for the last, well, since the end of the war, 70 years, um, are slowly but surely breaking down. And I think that is characteristic to all of our societies. Um, you know, when I was young and naive, as I mentioned, I moved to Bratislava in the summer of 1994. And in those days, if you were working in a political party institute, you sort of followed this Germanic model that there should be a large center right party in the political spectrum, a large center left party in the political, political spectrum, um, probably a pro business sort of classic European liberal party, um, uh, maybe a green party. You know, to sort of cover the part of the left that was focused more on environmental issues, and then other parties that were more regional or linguistic or historical uh, in nature. <clears throat> and we sort of believed uh, in those days that that model would be the case, would obtain forever. Right? Um, we now see across Europe that that is no longer the case. Um, the French Socialist Party, a um, hundred years of amazing political history is all but gone. Um, the, the, even in Austria, you know, the, in the, in the first elections after the war, Barrett, correct me if I'm wrong, if, I'm, if, I, if, I, if I have the numbers right, would have been like 1946 or 48. Um, the two big parties took 90% of the vote um, in this country. That is unimaginable now, right? Because the political spectrum has so diversified. You could say broken down, you could say fractured. There are lots of words to use for that process. Um, but there is, there is almost no continental European uh, country right now that has a, politi a political party spectrum of fewer than four or five or six competitive parties. That's a huge change. And the reason um, that we see so many parties is because of growing dissatisfaction with the traditional parties to be able to meet voter demands and meet voter needs, right? Used to be, of course, uh, if you grew up in a village in 
Um, uh, you know, you probably went to church on Sunday morning and did mass and then immediately went to vote after that. And it was fairly clear that the two were connected, right? Uh, politically, culturally, politically, economically, um, the institutions on which our political parties were built, whether it's the church on the center right or the trade union movement on the center left or the small business community for the liberals, those things were sort of self-evident in society. They no longer are across Europe. And so we see all sorts of emerging parties, we call them pop-up parties. Um, we can talk about populism later. I'd love to explore that. Um, but in Europe, um, because you have in almost every country a history of multi-party systems, you see fracturing in the parties. That's not the case in the United States. Right? We have two political parties. We only have two political parties. For my lifetime, I think it's a fairly safe bet that we will only have two political parties. I mean, there are some small exceptions if you want to get into the detail um, of the fact that the Democratic Party technically in Minnesota is called something else, right? But in essence, we have two parties. And all of the um, uh, ideological conflict, all of the debate about policy, all of the debate about personnel that has uh, driven uh, the European political party spectra to fragment into different parties. All of that pressure for us needs to be accommodated in one of the two parties or in both of the two parties. So, you know, I think in uh, the run up to 2016, you saw essentially an insurgency in the Republican Party led by Donald Trump um, that um, picked up voters and picked up energy and absorbed the residual energy from our Tea Party movement um, to uh, win the nomination for the presidency in 2016. Um, I think you can make a very good case on the other side of the spectrum uh, that the same thing has happened in the Democrat Party. Um, if you take a look at the rise of Bernie Sanders and AOC and her squad of young Congress people from, you know, uh, in the Congress just elected in the 2018 cycle, both of our parties are changing. This is no surprise. Both of our parties have been changing since the founding of the Republic. Um, similarly, um, the performance of the parties in our states has been changing. States which are traditionally, we say, blue for Democrat, um, are becoming more red, and states that are traditionally red are becoming more blue. And of course, in between, they're purple, right? Um, and that's where the battle is being fought now, in those purple places in the United States. Um, I'll give you a, a very tangible example. Um, I live my family, family and I have a house in Northampton County, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania swing state this year, like it was last time. I just, as Vanner said, I just came from there last week. I have had a negative COVID test in the meantime. Just so you know. um, uh, I just came from there last week and um, uh, Northampton County, Pennsylvania, where I live, was one of the 26 counties in the United States that switched, that voted twice for Barack Obama and then last time voted for Donald Trump. Now that may seem completely irrational, right? Particularly from the European perspective. Um, but there were good reasons for that. And it's all, you know, the polling has been exhausted. We can talk in more detail about that. But those are the places that swing the overall national vote because of the way our electoral college is set up. We can debate whether you think it's a fair system, whether I think it's a fair system. It's the system we have, right? And it's the system we went into the 2016 election with. It's the system we went into this election with. So, um, so much of the uh, effort of both campaigns, because of the way the system is structured, goes into those states and those counties and those media markets where it's actually competitive, because vast parts of the United States are simply not competitive. We know that the Republicans are going to win across the, you know, the Mississippi Basin to the west, to the Rockies, up and down from Canada to Mexico. And we know that the Democrats are going to win the entire West Coast, the entire East Coast, and parts of the bottom, right? The question is, where is the fight? And because of that, and because it comes down in many cases to just maybe 50 counties in the entire country, right? So much of the effort, so much of the energy, and therefore so much of the conflict, and so much of the polarization, so much of the battle um, is driven by how those places in the country are going to vote. Um, um, it is as um, mean um, a campaign season as I have ever lived through there. Uh, my first election was for 
I voted for Ronald Reagan in uh, 1980. So that was my first, right? Um, and in those days, you know, um, people talked about Ronald Reagan being incapable of being president, um, a bad movie actor, um, not up on the issues, uh, falling asleep in meetings, uh, you name it, right? I remember the critique, right? Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I don't want people to lose sight of the fact that American politics has always, and I mean always, from the very beginning of the Republic, been a, been a mean, mean, mean business. Right? It's much more aggressive and much more mean spirited and much more uh, conflict ridden and much more brutal, frankly, than any political system I've seen in Europe, with the potential exception of the UK, right? Which is more, well, right, exactly, right? Um, so um, nobody should be surprised by that. Um, but there's also no question that the, the, the introduction of the immediacy of social media now. I mean, it's difficult for me to put my Twitter account away. Right? I have to like push my phone away. Um, has intensified that polarization uh, to an even greater extent than we have uh, seen before. Just to wrap up the first question, I, I do you know want to remind everybody that this isn't just a presidential election. Um, there's a Senate election going on too, um, uh, uh, which you know could I, will, which will either uh, maintain the Republican majority or switch to a Democrat majority. And the House, all the seats in the House, of course, are up again this year also. So, and then all sorts of governor's elections and state senate elections and state house elections and dog catcher elections and you know everything else that we elect people for all around the country. So it's not just the presidency. Um, although that's where all the attention goes, particularly uh, from here in Europe. Um, I'll stop it. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, overview about uh, the general situation. <laughs> Maybe let's go a little bit into sure. uh, the personal uh, infight between uh, the candidates and the parties. Uh, let me start it in a way. Uh, when Donald Trump was elected president four years ago, I think it was clear for everybody that a very unusual political person, person now would uh, be at the top of the United States and the Western world. Uh, Donald Trump even made no secret out uh, of, he even promised this continuity was in politics, uh, internal and also in foreign politics. Uh, and of course, uh, there were already discussions. I just wonder, you know, when you look at this situation, that even very prominent, Republican personalities like Romney, like the former uh, John McCain and his family, like even uh, the majority leader in the Senate, Mitch McNeil, McConnell. Mitch McConnell. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, maybe he's not decent as, as Romney and uh, John McCain, but still he's criticizing in public the president. How is it possible? that he really can be elected or be elected. So uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, the first of which is structural. Um, and I, I, I'll come back to a point I made uh, in the opening. Uh, and I, I, it, it's, I search for ways to get my European friends to, to have insight into this because it's, it's a difficult thing to fathom. When you only have two parties, right, you are inevitably going to have a very diverse range of opinion in both parties. I think it's clear that uh, in the United States, over the course of my lifetime at least, you know, the Republican Party has gone further to the right, um, and the Democrat Party has gone further to the left, um, and, and they're therefore become more homogeneous than they had been before. But even then, you know, um, if you're running two parties in a country of 330 million people, um, those two parties by definition are going to be diverse in their opinions inside and in their personal conflicts inside the party. Um, uh, so that's point number one. Um, point number two, um, it's, 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 it's absolutely crucial to keep focus, I think, from a European perspective all the time on the fact that America is a, is a federal system. Um, there is nothing like the degree of political centralization in the United States that you have in any country in Europe. 
just said I can bring it. Um, you've been to the Republican Party headquarters in Washington, right? It's it's a building that's like I don't know three stories tall and and you know has room for offices maybe for I don't know twenty five people in it. It's a small thing just as a building because all the central parties don't have much power, right? The real power in politics in the United States is forced down to the states and to the congressional districts and the mayorships and, and that level. So, you know, um, uh, uh, an individual senator in either party, um, frankly, very often doesn't have much to win or to lose from being related to the president of either party, right? Um, uh, Mitt Romney um, is um, uh, is perfectly capable of getting himself elected as a Republican um, from his home state, with or without the support of the president. Right? I know it sounds difficult here because it's, it's it's tough to imagine anybody in the I don't know the SPU um, going out in a in a state in Canton. Are there any SPU voters in Canton? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, and like aggressively running a campaign in Corinthia against the leadership of the party in Vienna, right? I mean, it, it can happen more now than it ever happened before, but that's normal in the United States, right? So John McCain did not depend on Donald Trump for a single vote in Arizona. And so he had complete freedom and flexibility to take whatever position he wanted to take. And I think the same is the case for Mitt Romney um, in, uh, in Utah. Um, as it is for you know Democrat senators who don't necessarily agree with Joe Biden on a given set of positions, and you know takes a campaign this year, so they're going to probably close in on him because they want they want to move in. Um, you know, there will our, our our parties will be characterized by those kinds of internal public um, debates in ways that I think makes most Europeans feel like how is it even possible, right? So. Um, uh, uh, in some states, it would be to the advantage of the president to work closely with uh, the two senators or one of the two senators, one or both, and members of Congress to get reelected. And in other states, it's not a benefit to, to do that. Similarly, um, if you're a senator running uh, in, um, in a swing state, I'm just hypothetically, my home state, Pat Toomey, Senator Pat Toomey, he's not up this year. Um, but if he were running um, in a year um, where President Trump were running, he has some decisions to make because it's a swing state. He would look probably for some distance between him and the president um, in his positions for the voters in Pennsylvania. But even though they're both Republicans, and even though Senator Toomey would probably support the president on a wide range of issues, right? it's all about what those individual politicians, candidates, can deliver in their states and in their congressional districts. Sometimes being aligned with the president helps. Sometimes being aligned with the president hurts. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I said at the beginning that uh, everyone was aware that Donald Trump would be an unusual president, yeah. but I guess nobody has foreseen that he would be such an unusual president uh, with a style that uh, especially nobody can understand. Yeah. I mean, the way he is having his stuff the way he's presenting new ideas, the way he, uh, I don't know, he's announcing anything uh, is completely different to the well-known, usual style of politicians. Sure. Uh, how can this be successful? Uh, well, um, I, I guess I would answer the question in two words and then try to explain myself, if that makes sense. Uh, reality television. <laughs> right. um, and I, I, and I, I say it in part to get a laugh, right? But I want to explore it a little bit because I think it's important. Um, you know, uh, Vera, you and I came up um, in a political culture um, that had emerged from the Second World War um, that valued uh, finding ways to work together so that we, because we learned how to do that uh, in the conflict, right? And we learned that in order to, 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 to succeed and put the conflict behind us, we had to find ways to reach across the aisle. Right? This is the, the glory days. People talk all the time about nonpartisanship, 
uh, in the United States, right? And there's great sociological studies that have been done over the years about America after the war and how the, the soldiers who came back from the war were so colored by the war and had been put into this great melting pot, different uses of the word melting pot together. Um, you know, whether they were conservative or liberal or Christian or Jewish or Muslim or whatever they were, right? They were Americans at that point, and they came home and they formed all of these amazing sort of civil society organizations that we all know, and I at least grew up in, um, that put people together. It didn't matter if you were a Republican or a Democrat, if you were in the Rotary Club in your hometown, you went to breakfast together with everybody else because that's what you did. Right? Um, but that system has slowly but surely been breaking down, I think, in the American case, ever since Vietnam and Watergate. Um, and uh, it has been uh, uh, further changed by the introduction into culture of things like reality television. Right? I'm, I'm 57 years old. Right? Um, I hear people uh, on the street in the United States today and on television in the United States say things that I, that I wouldn't want my children to hear until they turned 18. Right? But it's become normal. Culture, I think, has become much more coarse. Um, it's become much ruder. Um, there is much less um, a benefit uh, in careers um, to being the one who finds a way to make a compromise. Um, we have become, I think, so characterized by this idea that you have to completely, um, uh, uh, that every question is a, a zero sum game, right? That you either win everything or you lose everything in every debate. And that, to me, is expressed in you know the range of reality TV shows that you see, and it's now expressed in our political culture. Um, you know, President Trump, I think, was very clearly elected. He would tell you certainly, and I think the electorate would say the same: elected to disrupt the system, right? Um, and you know, I think you can make the argument that the system needed to be disrupted. Um, you know, I think back to that. I told you about my home county, Northampton County, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, if you're from Northampton County, um, and you voted twice for Barack Obama, and then you voted for Donald Trump, you didn't do that because you became racist overnight, or you became homophobic overnight, or you became, you became xenophobic overnight. You did it because you looked around and said, you know what, there's something wrong here. And the kind of people who have been running the system for a very long time are going to deliver the system that has been running for a very long time. And Donald Trump was the one person who walked into that and said no. It does not have to be like that. Now, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying I think what people perceive. Right? After, after a decade or more in, of being in Iraq and Afghanistan with no evidence, well, certainly nothing definable as victory, right? Um, um, after uh, the economic crisis of, um, of, of 2008, 2009, and you know, the effects that we still see of that, I think people, I, I can just, you know, talk about anecdotally about my friends and family, um, you know, who are doctors and lawyers and, you know, dentists. They're not, you know, everybody hears about the disaffected white working class, right? And that's a factor. I mean, there's no question that that is, uh, you know, a component of this. But I'm talking about university edu educated folks who just looked around and said, you know what? If we vote for Hillary Clinton, we're going to get absolutely more of the same, and we're going to take a risk on this other thing because we want the system disrupted. You know? And he did what he promised. Um, and he has done that in domestic politics, and he's done it in international politics. Um, and I will tell you, um, and maybe we'll have a chance to explore some of the international stuff a little bit more. I think there are a number of points on which, um, if he loses, he will have still defined American policy for the next administration um, with regard to how we deal with much of the rest of the world. And that, I would say, is because I think the American people wanted a disruption. Um, they, they, they didn't know exactly what they were going to get. They didn't know what it was going to look like policy by policy. Um, but I will tell you that there is not a single person that I know back in my home county who voted for him the first time who's not going to vote for him this time. Not one. So then it becomes a question of like who else goes out and votes. Right? And, um, you know, we can we can talk more about that if you want, but in, in, in the United States, it is always a question of who motivates whom to vote. Well, when uh, I was a young politician myself, I 
I held many seminars and I tried to help people from when you get when you want to get elected, you need sympathy, you need confidence, and you need energy. Mm -hmm. So far, uh, and when once you have achieved certain position, of course, people also will ask you for the achievements, yep. whether you can prove that you have uh, confidence not only by by wishing or saying, right. but by <laughs> right. uh, where would you see I mean, in the eyes of the American population uh, Donald Trump's achievements? Well, okay, so I don't make any, um, any uh, uh, contention that I speak for the, the 330 million people in the United States, right? Um, I can only say it's about <laughs> my, my time to use it. Um, I think, uh, let's see, um, domestically, I think many people on the vote in the United States, particularly on the conservative side of the spectrum because of Supreme Court nominations, and we've seen that you know, made manifest this year um, in the nomination um, that followed uh, Justice Ginsburg's death. Um, uh, so that's one group of, of voters, and I think they're very happy um, with what they've seen. Um, I think, uh, you know, another uh, component of what encourages people to go out and vote is what they think is going to happen to the economy. That's probably the most important. And before COVID, I don't think there was anybody who would argue that the American economy wasn't growing and, you know, expanding and unemployment was at its lowest point, not only just for white Americans, but for almost every subcategory of Americans, lowest point in four years. Um, you know, so um, I think, and then there are others that we can talk about domestically, internationally. Um, uh, you know, um, former Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and Eurasia, Wes Mitchell, who you probably know, yeah. Um, uh, I think did a did a really excellent job um, laying out um, the the administration's argument for um, encouraging um, our NATO allies in Europe to to take on more responsibility. And his argument always was, it's not that that the alliance can't do what it needs to do necessarily. Right? We can we can accomplish what we need to accomplish at the current level of that way. Um, and it's not that we have to restructure um, the entire alliance and rebuild you know, to, to the Cold War levels because of you know, Vladimir Putin and the Russian Federation. But um, there will come a time in the future um, at which the American public, which pays for a lot of this, right, simply says, it's just not worth it anymore. And the idea at the beginning of the administration was to get out ahead of that, to say, no, actually, look, everybody's contributing. Right? Everybody's putting in more. Different for Austria, a neutral situation might get different. But but certainly, you know, for your big neighbor to the northwest, um, an important question, right? Um, and uh, I think the administration wanted to get out ahead on that, and I frankly think that was exactly the right policy. I might have, you know, been a little bit more diplomatic about it, but um, but that's me. That's not him. Right? That's not how he works. Um, so there's that. I think. We can talk more about China. Um, I think, you know, there's no question that America needed to reorient its policy toward China or its policy and how to deal with China. Um, that's been done clearly. And, you know, I think, frankly, uh, Europe is moving in the same direction. Uh, so I think there are a number of things that people would look at and say, um, you know, that that's, that if they voted for him, that that's what he's accomplished. Okay, so uh, I mean, when we are talking about the situation, what could Europeans who are very skeptic? You know, you probably know the polls, you know, in Germany, uh, there's a vast majority that thinks uh, Donald Trump is a danger for peace, sure. more than Putin or Xi Jinping, okay. uh, and so on. Uh, so, what do you think that Europe can expect from a second term? Whether this is EU or this is NATO. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, Mary, many times you have been with us at um, at the Republican National Convention, right? Because we always sponsor a visitors program. Um, and um, uh, this year, of course, we couldn't do that uh, because of COVID, because of all the confusion around the election or the the, the conventions both. Um, so we did a virtual panel um, alongside the convention. And this was in August, I think it was August 
6th or August 27th. So during the Republican National Convention, but not at it. Um, and we had uh, actually two panels that morning, and we co sponsored the event with the, um, the delegation of the European Union to the United States. Um, uh, the EU has a fantastic ambassador in the United States, a Greek diplomat, former Greek foreign minister, who is excellent. Um, comes from, he comes from Paso, uh, from, so from the left, um, politically in a Greek context, but is doing a great job representing the EU in Washington. So we decided to do this, this set of discussions jointly um, because we believe at IRI um, that this relationship with Europe is the most important single relationship that we have on the planet. Yes, there's a trade relationship with China, right? Obviously, right? But in terms of maintaining the kind of world that we want to maintain, the relationship with Europe is the crucial one. And, that, and I'm sorry, that's not to diminish Japan or Korea or our allies uh, in the Pacific, including Australia. Um, but the, the, the European American relationship is key. And so um, we had one panel that looked at economics and trade, and one panel that looked at um, uh, uh, security and foreign policy. Um, and we had um, the, the now former Irish commissioner, Bill Hogan, who, yeah. who was right in the middle of that terrible crisis that he didn't survive that day. Um, and his successor, uh, Maria McGuinness, uh, the then first vice president of the European Parliament. Um, and uh, a retired US Senator, Brad Smith, uh, the CEO from Microsoft, um, two sitting United States congressmen, um, the former Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs. Um, and I, the only reason I go through all of that is to tell you that I walked out of that day just absolutely mystified that we found so much in common to talk about and to agree on. Um, because those things are there, right? Unfortunately, I think sometimes they get lost in the atmospherics um, of the debate between Europe and the United States. And I'll give you one example. Um, I don't know how much it's been focused on here because I, I, I haven't been following the German language press on it very much, frankly, sorry. Um, but um, the conflict uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean is, um, you know, it's, it's been there for a long time. It doesn't really ever fully go away, but this summer, of course, it escalated because one side decided to escalate. Um, and, um, that, uh, you know, through, as if 2020 couldn't get more complicated, right? that threw us all another sort of set of things that we had to deal with. And I think it became very clear, very fast, that the United, in that situation, the United States and Germany were each in its own way um, trying to move the transatlantic community to a resolution um, that would work for both of them. Didn't get a lot of press, wasn't covered, you know, in the newspapers every day. President and Merkel weren't, you know, like going out to meetings together, but but it showed me that there are places in the world, still many places, um, where we have common interests and where our foreign policy and defense system and your foreign policy and defense systems will drive us together on those issues um, uh, because we do have common interests uh, there. Um, so I think there are lots of those out there, right? We have to figure out jointly how we deal with China. Um, there's another great opportunity, and I think, um, you know, uh, little by little, uh, there is a developing consensus between the United States and Brussels and the national capitals, some more than others, some faster than others, um, that we have to work together on China. Um, uh, I'll just finish that section and say that there's an excellent um, article, it's out today, by a guy named Richard Fontaine. Um, who was a, at a place called the Center for New American Security, CNAS, um, who talks about um, what the next president um, will have to work on with regard to foreign policy, what, what this administration will leave behind, whether it's the next Trump administration or the Biden administration. It's a really, I think, excellent article. So I'd recommend you, if you can, take a look at it. Okay, staying with this question, you know, uh, of course, this uh, rivalry between the states and China, uh, it's not only on the unbalanced uh, trade situation, but certainly it's a big question, who will make the rules in the second half of the century? Absolutely. Okay. And if I look, you know, uh, to uh, Donald Trump's performance uh, with the rest of the world, I would say, if I just look, you know, the way he's treating or uh, neglecting the United Nations, the way, I don't know, uh, just a few 
miles from his home, uh, you have you have uh, the center of the United Nations, uh, the headquarters. Xi Jinping is coming, making a great speech, and he is more or less all the way making a video presentation and expressing by that. I don't care too much. Uh, do you think that uh, this way you really can assemble in the world so many states behind the world? Yeah, so this is, a, I think, a, a core question um, in understanding uh, uh, the way that the, the, the administration looks at uh, the American position in the world. Um, you know, it's no surprise that if you go back to the campaign, uh, which the people who were involved in the campaign um, from the beginning, that there was a deep, deep, deep skepticism of what they very negatively call multilateralism. Right? From their perspective, um, you know, it's uh, you, multilateralism and globalization um, were negatives. Um, now, you, you can agree or disagree with that argument, but there is there is intellectual coherence in the argument. You can disagree with it, I get that. Um, but it's not an unworthy argument. Um, and I think that very much has defined the way the administration uh, approaches the world. Um, so much of what we see done is done bilaterally. We see it time and time and time again. Um, um, you know, I think, um, the, the, my opinion would be that the approach of the United States should be that if there are multilateral uh, institutions that work, um, then we should invest in them. Right? I mean, the OSCE is a great one here, right? Um, what, um, what mechanism do we have, for example, um, to help drive a negotiation process through a transition in Belarus other than the OSCE, right? Where both us, both we and the Russian Federation are members. So there are lots of multilateral organizations out there that have proven their value and have proven their worth and do work and can work, you know, along with us for the interest of the United States and the interests of our friends and allies in Europe. Um, but that doesn't mean that they all do, right? Um, again, I'm old enough to remember when um, um, Reagan was president and we went through this whole discussion with the United Nations that we were gonna defund the United Nations, right? And he appointed then governor of Pennsylvania, Dick Thornburg, to we take a complete analysis of what America pays for the United Nations, and we we're supposed to cut the hell out of it. Right? This, 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 there's nothing new in any of this. Um, so, um, 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 that then raises the question of how we, if not that, then what's the alternative to dealing with China? Right? Or dealing with a power like China? Russia, I mean, we can talk more about that, but uh, I mean, I think. I think increasingly um, we all look at what China is doing specifically in this part of Europe um, and think, you know, uh, this is a qualitative change. Right? The fact that, that the Russian Federation, as it's currently constituted under Vladimir Putin, would be trying to disrupt democratic politics and disrupt the institutions that we have collectively created to protect European securities and support, that's no surprise. Right? That's old news. Right? I mean, you know, the Russian victory monument is only just down the street here, right? Um, they've been a factor in the region for as long as there has been the region. Um, and I think, you know, if I look at our political party friends um, across the region from the Baltic states down to the Western Balkans, you know, there's a fairly high degree of understanding and resilience to dealing with Russian engagement in that form, you know, to undermine democratic processes. Not so with China. Um, if I look at the 17 plus one process, I, mean, I just heard today that Estonia may actually formally leave the 17 one process, plus one process and return it to 16 plus one. Um, and that is because I think people have begun to realize that all of the promise that seems to come with a relationship with China at the beginning, is very often not borne out. And I'll offer one very tangible example just to close this answer. Um, and I just go back to the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, during the course of the conflict, I think it was in what are we now? October, so it would have been late August, maybe very early September. The, the Chinese foreign minister uh, did a tour across Northern Europe, maybe Berlin, Paris, maybe Brussels, I can't remember exactly. And then his parallel in the party, right? So the guy who runs the party's foreign policy apparatus, not the official ministry, right? But the party's apparatus, um, did a tour to Athens and Madrid. 
Um, and in Athens, um, the Greek government under Mitsotakis um, pushed hard to get the Chinese to support them in the conflict with Turkey, right? Just as Beijing had done to get the former government of Greece to support it in the South China Sea in 2016. The Greek government did it. Beijing this time would not do it, right? So, you know, if people are looking for reciprocity in this relationship, um, I think they probably need to find someplace else to look. And that will become clearer and clearer and clearer with every day that goes by as China doesn't deliver on the economic promise that it seems to offer, you know, land of milk and honey with highways and trains and jobs, right? On the one hand, and then where it does deliver shows that it brings with it the kind of, you know, surveillance technology that we see in Serbia. So I suspect that's a place where American and European opinion will increasingly increasingly converge. Uh, Malte, so many highly interesting questions. For example, I was all uh, uh, canceling the deal, looked at the deal with your mm -hmm. so maybe we can uh, talk about it uh, in the public discussion. Sure. My last question yep. before I, I give the chance to the public is would be I mean, there's some speculation, not only in Europe, but also in the United States. If uh, the outcome of the election uh, would be very close, uh, do you see any state crisis in the way that uh, Donald Trump would deny to leave the White House? Uh, you know, uh, Werner, I, um, maybe I'm hopelessly naive. Uh, that's, that's entirely possible, right? Um, but, you know, I um, have spent my entire life um, believing in and defending the Constitution of the United States. Um, it's, a doc it's a document that's uh, survived an awful lot of crisis in its past, um, you know, not least of which a civil war, uh, which literally ripped the country apart. Um, and, um, you know, I think uh, uh, it is very clear um, that um, the other stakeholders in the, in the constitutional process, um, all of the stakeholders in the constitutional process um, believe in the Constitution and uh, that the Constitution will be carried out uh, and will carry out the will of the American people as it is expressed um, already now, because people are already voting, right? I was going to say on November 3rd, but lots of people have already voted. Um, and as the votes are counted, um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to exclude the possibility that there's going to be some chaos. Um, in none of our electorals and none of our voting systems uh, is perfect. And um, this particular year, because of COVID, there's going to be all sorts of pressure put on people to count votes at, in numbers that they have not had to count for. And it's been automatic, right? So, you know, am I absolutely certain that we'll go to bed on the night of November 3rd, as we have for my whole lifetime, knowing who's going to be president of the United States? That I don't um, But, you know, uh, the last time we went through this in any kind of serious way was in 2000 um, in the Bush Gore election. And the Constitution proved its strength then, um, in, you know, in the way that Florida turned out. And it'll do that again. I, I, don't, I don't wake up at night worried about the future of the United States Constitution and the ability of people who are responsible for it to carry it out. Okay. So, thank you very much for this first round. Now, uh, I would offer the chance to ask one uh, the other question, so far, uh, my question is, uh, I would like to ask a question uh, to Jan Surajak on this issue. I see some familiar faces from the last time I was here at the Academy. Um, <laughs> and that's one of them, right there. <laughs> yes, please. I will take this off. Uh, yeah, so, for this uh, task. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the things we have to learn how to do, right? Anyway, <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> well, uh, of course, uh, you you cause or uh, uh, many questions, but I will just try to formulate one or two. Sure. One uh, word you mentioned was the disruption. How far could this disruption go? Because after all, we shouldn't. Uh, hesitate to go back in history. About 150 years ago, there was a civil war in the United States. The attitudes of the two parties, two parties were completely different. The Democrats were 
for slavery, the Republicans against it. It just a uh, uh, little decay. So uh, this is the first question. And uh, uh, the second will be about the electoral system. We were speaking about the Constitution of the United States, which is now 250 years old, right, with uh -huh. some changes. Um, the whole election system is very specific with um, electors, which play an important role, I think, specific. Gerrymandering, of course, which is not also in Europe, it's not specific, but still. And uh, some other practical points, for instance, here uh, in Austria, everybody uh, who lives here must go to the Einwohner Amt and they get his address. Right. And Americans don't have that. Right. In some cases, they have a um, well, car license. Mm -hmm. So, and just thinking the unthinkable, what could be destruction? And destruction, of course, we feel it already now in Europe because the whole Atlantic system is falling apart in a sense. How, what would be then your recommendation to the Europeans? Sure. How to work or uh, prevent this destruction in transatlantic relations? Yep. Um, thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> So uh, your point about the fact that um, you know the, the parties uh, in the era of the Civil War and thereafter, uh, you know, were very different uh, is, I think, a, a, a remarkably important one, and I'll just you know highlight that with a little detail. Um, in the elections of eighteen seventy or seventy two, I'm sorry, I've forgotten which one. Um, uh, in South Carolina. Um, the people of South Carolina elected an entirely black House delegation, 100% black, right? Amazing, right? Every one of them a Republican. So, you know, uh, uh, yes, um, your, your point is exactly right. The parties have changed a great deal. The parties will change a great deal. Um, you know, one of the things that I personally find most frustrating about the Republican Party today as a lifelong Republican is the fact that we no longer talk seriously about the deficit, right? The federal budget deficit. We are spending money like there's no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. well, but there is a tomorrow, right? So, <laughs> and at some, point, at some point, somebody's going to have to pay for it, right? Fathers need to no end, right? But again, you know, in a two-party system, you kind of have to make some choices, right? You're not going to get 100% of what you want from one or from the other. So both of our parties are shifting. They continue to shift. They will shift for as long as there are parties and as long as there is the United States. I just think that's natural. Um, on the transatlantic uh, question, you know, um, so Barry noted that my title these days is Senior Director for Transatlantic Strategy, which means that I get the luxury inside our system of thinking about the transatlantic relationship pretty much every day, right? which for me is great, because uh, there's nothing else I'd rather do. So, you know, I, I, I say I've got the best job that you listen to. Um, uh, and I get to do things like this, which is also good. Um, and um, so I think back to, you know, where the relationship has been in the past, right? And uh, Barrett mentioned that I did a full break at the University of Kiel, uh, which, you know, there's nothing further away in the German speaking realm from Vienna than Kiel, right? Um, it's very, very, very far. In fact, when I was a student there, I can remember that there were joint broadcasts between uh, NDA and Deutsche Rundfunk and Erdogan um, here in Vienna, right? So that you could hear these two versions of German, you know, on the radio as they talked about rock and roll. Um, you know, the Germans would probably say that this isn't really even German, but that's a different subject. Um, the point is that while I was at the University of Kiel, um, the NATO uh, dual track decision was made to put uh, medium range uh, nuclear forces um, in Belgium, West Germany, the UK, the Netherlands, maybe another place or two, I can't remember the details. Um, and um, uh, that was President Reagan. Um, and um, the German Bundesbahn put on extra trains between Kiel and Hamburg 
to take the students down to Hamburg so they could do, go to these huge anti-American, anti-missile, anti-Reagan demonstrations, right? And there would be 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 people out in, in the big cities of West Germany and in Holland and in Belgium. There are, uh, Wilfred Martin tells a great story about facing up to a mob in, uh, in Belgium at the same time. Um, and uh, uh, all of that um, was put together in the context of Ronald Reagan is fundamentally endangering the security of Europe. Um, he doesn't care at all about the Europeans. He's going to turn Europe into a nuclear wasteland because of his Cold War crusade against the, Russia, against the Soviet Union. Right? And now there are statues to Ronald Reagan in Berlin. So, you know, all I say is we've seen this movie before, right? There's always tension between Europe and the United States. Always. There ought to be. We're democracies. There should be tension. We should be able to express that, right? Is Donald Trump perhaps, you know, in this generation a great disruptor? Yes. I don't think there's any question about that. But Reagan also was a disruptor. Um, so the trick then is to find ways, places that we can actually talk, right? I had a boss once who told me, if you're going into a negotiation and there are 10, 10, 10 issues on the table, there's going to be, you know, two at the one end that you're not going to agree on ever, two at the other end that you agree on all the time, focus on the six, right? And that's what I think we need to do. And the Eastern Med is one, um, how we deal with China is another, um, um, how we deal with countries like Belarus um, is another. I, you know, credit to the European Union for, for imposing sanctions um, on um, the, the, the 40 people in the regime, unfortunately, not on Lukashenko, but on the 40 people in the regime. So, you know, uh, situations like that around the world, we can find ways to work together on. Um, but, you know, there has to be leadership on both sides from inside the system to say, okay, these are things we can actually do. The Western Balkans is another one, right? We, I think, you know, it may not be a popular perspective in Vienna, but I think we, well, actually, maybe it would be. Um, I think we need to find a way to work together to get the Baltic, the Balkan states in the European Union and fully into NATO, right? So that Europe is finally integrated. Um, and, you know, there will be nothing but support for, the, for that from Washington, from any of the churches, as far as I'm concerned. Go, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Actually, I, I would like to follow up on two issues. First of all, on the on the issue of disruption, and secondly, also on the issue of the, uh, of the six points that you just uh, uh -huh. okay. mentioned. And that is, uh, I think you would all agree that uh, I hope that at least that Trump is rather the uh, the symptom than the cause. I would also agree that uh, the disruption not uh, only affects the U.S. internally, but more likely affects the entire international system. And that brings me back to, to the question that I would actually like to raise and is, is there a kind of, uh, of point five and six as far as the strategic chessboard is concerned in the relations of the US vis-a-vis -vis the international system, vis-a-vis -vis multilateralism, vis-a-vis -vis its relations to China, uh, Russia, Europe, et cetera, et cetera. So what I do miss so far is we are rather describing the status quo but I'm not seeing any perspectives as a status quo cost is concerned. Meaning, what is the, the, the way ahead? What is the, the, the perspective for the future for, uh, from the US vis a vis the international system, from the US vis a vis uh, its, its uh, allies? Uh, great question. Thank you, uh, Ken Duck. Um, I, so let's, let's take them by baskets, I guess, right? Um, I don't. I, I think the the the, the revision, the, the new version of the um, of the NAFTA agreement um, shows that that the United States is still willing to do trade deals if those deals are perceived to be beneficial to the United States. Right? So it isn't the case of just simple across the board rejection of trade deals, right? Multilateral trade deals, even right in that case. Um, I think um, the new um, uh, the new um, uh, uh, commissioner responsible for trade, um, I can't remember his name, the former Latvian Prime Minister Dombrovskis, um, has actually gotten off to a great start in Washington, um, trying to move the trade discussion forward. And I think there's room for that. 
Um, you know, I don't, you don't have to go very far into the American heartland to see that you can't go very far into the American heartland without finding European covenant. They're everywhere, right? Um, so I think there is a basis there, um, um, and hope even there, um, uh, as we look forward. The administration is not necessarily opposed to trade deals, quad trade deals, but it has to be something that it can argue works for its people, for the people that voted for it, right? So I think there's opportunity there. I keep coming back to the Eastern Mediterranean because I really think that's a great opportunity. Um, it's complicated. Um, you know, Turkey has made all of our worlds more complex, backed up by Moscow. Um, um, it's particularly complicated for you because of the deal on immigration, uh, and I understand that. Um, but um, I, I think I think we have a common interest in ensuring that um, uh, uh, that countries like Greece and like Cyprus, the Republic of Cyprus. Um, you know, continue to have latitude to explore that, those waters and take advantage of those resources, you know, with, with the input of your companies, with the input of our companies, um, we have a common interest there in making sure that that area is stable. I personally, because I work in the democracy business, think that we have a common interest in places like Belarus um, and Venezuela. Um, and, you know, I could name six or seven others. Uh, I, I wouldn't disagree on common interests, but what strikes me is uh, you mentioned Reagan before, but Reagan and regimes can be had this this great chess board that at least he promoted. So there was a kind of a vision. Mm -hmm. And I apologize for my life. I, I, I do not see this vision at the moment. Mm -hmm. Is there a vision? Is there a way forward or is it just Trump and the disruption of the system? Um, we need to have a second step after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't mind the catharsis. Yeah, no, so I mean, I don't know. Maybe, again, maybe I'm hopelessly naive, but you know, if I look at the discussion. Maybe I am. But, maybe I am. Well, maybe we all have to be, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can't be diplomats and not be on some level, right? Um, I, you know, so uh, let's, let's look at, let's sort of like talk past the, the chatter, right? And look at what's actually being done. Um, you know, if I look at the discussions between Pompeo and Burrell um, on China um, back in September um, in this process of setting up a US-EU dialogue on China, that strikes me as something we can invest in and both benefit from. And frankly, that would have been unimaginable two years ago, right? Um, I think, uh, uh, We're going to have to get past North, North Street too, um, and then, and that's not in your court. I get that. Um, and that's also a country northwest of here, you know, um, much larger. Um, I think uh, there's lots of room for us to talk about um, uh, 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 access to natural gas and access to other uh, energy resources between North America and Europe. Um, there's great potential there. So I. I, I I don't think we have to look super hard um, to find them, but it will not be, you know, if, the, if, if, if Trump wins re-election and there's a second Trump administration, you know, it will not be on climate, right? It, because some of the, those are the two issues that are over here, right? not the ones in the middle. Um, just like, you know, we're not going to talk collectively in the United States because we can't about the death penalty, you know, which of course the European Union would love us to do, right? But that's a state's issue in the United States, so that's not going to get talked about. Um, but I think there are other things. And you know, goodness knows the Chinese are gonna to continue to give us lots of things that we have to talk about um, because there's just no way around it anymore. No. Trying to be optimistic. First of all, uh, permit me to thank Minister and this arrangement and uh, also congratulate you being so candid and a right point. Uh, I think the question for all of the world is, is this the US that we expect? How can the other countries who trust US anymore? Apart from the serious damage to multilateralism, because this is working as a life, working young, which is unfortunate. But if the government in United States is making an agreement, like JCPOA, which is the manifestation of multilateral diplomacy. All countries, including US, two years in Vienna, 
and sign it on behalf of the United States and agree. And all of a sudden, the new president from different parts comes and say, disaster. I think this is the disaster, not the way that it was. And this is a serious concern, but not only European as allies, <clears throat> which unfortunately we've witnessed that they have been humiliated. In fact, this government's uh, attitude and conduct is unprecedented in the history of the United States. I think that there is no way to defend uh, the one who could uh, criticize you or NATO or other countries, or criticize even some treaties. But all of a sudden, uh, coming on the excuse that since I'm against Obama, whatever Obama has done is disaster, I said in CPOA or Paris Pag or whatever. <clears throat> this is not, I guess, another the issue is about the electoral college. Mm -hmm. For years, Americans are, in fact, pro uh, making uh, concerns about democracy in other countries. But Electoral College is an open, very clear signal of non-democratic system in the United States. In the same venue, two years ago, a minister invited the uh, speaker, and uh, everybody confessed, yes, an American confessed that this is a problem, but it is constitution and it's easy to amend the constitution. But sooner or later, as long as this amendment is not made, and like in Europe or any other democracy, every individual has one vote, then this is not a real democracy. At least US should not preach democracy for the others. The last point is about the multilateralism. We do respect. Democrat or Republican have misused or instrument, instrumentally used the multilateralism, in fact, in the United Nations or international organizations. But the way that the district administration has damaged the, in fact, the structure of democracy, of course, we have also criticism about the veto power, the existence of, and we expect to reform the United Nations. But at least this is the system we have to work with, or respect at least if this decision, unanimous decision. But ignoring all these, there is no justification to do so. How do you justify? Because more or less, I appreciate you being so candid, but I think more or less you would justify the way that the Trump administration is doing, is uh, the way that it's going. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let me take them one by one. Uh, I, um, and I, I will not say much about it. It's not my area of expertise. I don't know the Middle East. Um, I don't know Iran well at all. So I won't. I, I couldn't spend a lot of time on it. I won't. Um, I will only say that um, it's important to remember that um, the Obama administration, uh, in several cases, um, chose not to take multilateral international agreements to the United States Senate because they knew that it would not get passed. So, you know, I think one, that's an, that's an important step in understanding just exactly how, um, what commitment there is of the United States to a given agreement. The Senate in the Constitution has the right to ratify treaties, right? And unfortunately that wasn't done, right? So um, I'll, I'll stop with that. Um, the Electoral College, uh, I, I disagree fundamentally that it is undemocratic. Um, I think uh, we could debate about this, you know, for the next many evenings here in Vienna. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you look back to the founding, um, and even to recent times, uh, it is uh, remarkably democratic uh, in the way that it protects the interests of small states against the interests of big states. Um, you know, uh, I don't want to get into all the American history here, but just very briefly, um, when the Constitution was written, um, uh, there were four states that largely controlled everything. They controlled the economy, they controlled the political system. Four of the five first presidents of the United States came from the same state. Trivia question, which one? That was very far from there. Virginia. Um, so, you know, there was real serious concern um, in a state like Rhode Island um, that its northern neighbor, Massachusetts, which controlled the entire economic system in that part of the country, was going to inevitably have more power than it would have. 
And so the Constitution was designed to have uh, uh, a significant amount of power delivered to states as states, right? Not as component parts of a larger electoral unit, but as states. And therefore, um, the, the college was at least in part, there were other issues too with regard to slavery, and I'm not pretending those don't exist, right? But they were a, a significant motivation in designing the college the way it was designed um, was to protect the interests of small states. I know that it drives California crazy, right? That it gets the same treatment as Wyoming gets. And California perceives that to be unfair, but Wyoming does not. Um, and that's what a democracy is about, right? So um, believe me, um, you're, you, you, you are, I agree completely, Ambassador, that, um, that I agree with those people who say that undoing or going back to try to amend the Constitution at this point, I mean, who knows where that goes, right? And in this environment, I, mean, I, mean, I can't imagine anything that would be more disastrous right now than opening that debate, right? Um, and lastly, multilateralism. Um, you know, um, I, I haven't said the I word here today yet, but I will do it now. Um, there is a long and storied history of isolationism in the United States and in the Republican Party, right? Here too, none of this is new, right? Um, uh, uh, and, and, and you don't have to go very far back. You know, you can go to the immediate post-war period when the institutions of the United Nations, you know, driven by the sort of Rooseveltian vision um, of the new, then new world order, um, was very seriously criticized by large segments of the Republican Party. Now, we can agree on that or disagree on it, right? But it's, it is a fact. It is, it is in American culture. It is in American politics. It has always been, and frankly, it will always be. And part of the debate is to, is to explain why American engagement, and this is, I think, a lot of what I try to do here, why American engagement in the world actually benefits the United States, right? It's not about, you know, forcing somebody else to adopt the democracy. It's because good allies, good democracies make good allies for the United States because it's in the American interest to have that, right? Um, again, you know, that's to me, that's the great story of uh, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, you know, the countries east of here. This is a, this is a, a remarkable example of what good can be achieved, not only for the people who live in those countries, but for the international system, when Europe and the United States work together. People forget that now, right? Because we were walking along, we went for a walk along the Danube the other day, and I pointed out to the kids, or you know the kids, I pointed out that um, you know, the border with Austria is just a kilometer and a half down that way, right? And you could walk to Vienna if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for my wife's generation, you couldn't walk to Vienna, right? Because you'd be shot if you tried. And, you know, so this is an accomplishment. And we need, I think, as Europeans and Americans, very often to like remind ourselves sometimes of what we've accomplished, because we've accomplished a lot. And, you know, whether that looks in a multilateral system like it has always looked since the war, I don't know. Not sure. I think we need to ask ourselves if the systems continue to work or if they don't. And if they don't, then we need to find new systems. Sorry to be so transactional about it. Um, <laughs> if I can use that word. Okay. Last chance to ask a question. Okay. May I have a good Institute and since last Friday. Uh, so I have two questions, <laughs> very short. One question refers to the US election, and that is because you mentioned swing states, mm -hmm. and you gave an example with Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask the question, what you think are going to be other swing states, sure. interesting swing states that might decide mm -hmm. the direction of the U.S. election outcome. Mm -hmm. um, Michigan comes to my mind. Michigan comes to mind. Yeah. Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting, I think, for the audience. Sure. To, it's a pretty to short list. To, so. and, and to look at these particular swing states mm -hmm. during the election. And second question refers, uh, of course, to Europe. Now you spoke a lot about disruption, and on that 
uh, side of the Atlantic, it's obviously the same perception about the disruption of the relationship and the transatlantic relationship. Now, my fear is that uh, if we assume hypothetically that there's going to be a second mandate of Trump, particularly the relationship between the United States and Germany mm -hmm. is going to face a lot of disruption, no, no matter uh, what kind of transition the leadership in Germany is going to face. So no, no matter who is going to be the next chancellor. Yes. So, because if we look at to the UK, to France, to Central and Eastern European countries, uh, this relation, bilateral relationship is quite stable, mm -hmm. quite positive. Now, how do you see this? Because we know also that bad German-US relationship means also bad United States, European Union. Yeah, uh, sure. What is your assessment on that? Uh, okay, uh, so only easy questions. Um, uh, the first one, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, um, Arizona, North Carolina, Nevada. Florida? I think Florida is pretty much done. Uh, I could be wrong. So no, Biden in Florida. No, <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't. Yes, I don't vote in. I don't vote in Florida, so I, I can't tell. Uh, um, I think if, if you know, there are some ways. There are a couple of different ways to look at this. If Ohio is seriously in play, right, then it's probably very bad for the president, mm -hmm. right. Um, if Pennsylvania is very seriously in play, then it's probably not good for the vice president, right, because. You know, in American politics, you always talk about the path to 270, right? Votes in the electoral college. Um, uh, uh, the, the paths become much narrower. The path becomes much narrower for President Trump um, if he loses Pennsylvania. You know, in theory, you could pick something else on, um, but, you know, there just aren't that many places that are in play, right? Whereas Biden, um, theoretically, could still lose Pennsylvania and pick up something like Arizona, and you know put uh, uh, put two hundred seventy votes together, right? Um, so those are the ones that immediately come to mind. I mean, you can always look at Florida because it's always going to be interesting, right? Um, but I would say I would say those, and um, you know they uh, uh, the the Republican side would tell you these days that. They think they can be competitive in Washington State because of the the, the conflicts are in and around Seattle. Um, if between now and November third, it looks like a place like Washington State is close, then you know, then I think, then I think you know, it's going to be a very tough lift for Biden. On the other hand, you know, if some traditional um, heavily Republican states begin to look like they're in play. Um, you know, the Democrats, for example, will argue that they think they can win the Senate seat from Lindsey Graham in South Carolina, right? If that's the case, you know, then, then it's really tough to see how red gets to a victory uh, in November, right? It's all about the states. This is why I encourage, please, nobody pay attention to this number about who's winning on a national basis, because nobody cares. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters in as much as you're, like, trying to make an argument. You want to be seen to be able to be able to win, right? But in real votes, it doesn't matter. And Mary, you and I have gone through training after training after training after training with political party people around the region. And the first thing we always say is, what is politics about? And the particularly young people always tell you, well, it's about ideology, or it's about the party leader, or whatever. And I always say, no, it's about math, right? Because it's getting to the number you need to win. That's the only thing that matters when you're doing the analysis, right? Um, so there, there are two more debates. Who knows what they'll look like? You know, whether they'll be in person or be on Zoom, I don't know. Um, there's a vice presidential debate, like maybe this week, maybe Wednesday night. I'm still with the jelly, jelly. There's a lot of time still, and things could change a hundred times between now and the third. And don't forget that people are already voting. Right? So that's also a factor. Listen, um, so my very first foreign language was German. Um, I uh, went to Germany on an American Field Service Scholarship in the summer of 1979. To me, the German-American relationship has always been the most important relationship on the planet. It rips my heart out that we're at the place where we are now. It drives me crazy. 
Um, and you're absolutely right. The derivative problem is then the relationship between the United States and the EU because Germany is so defined in the EU. Um, uh, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, we do a lot of programs um, related to Germany, trying to figure out a way, how do we pass this? Like, how do we, you know, how do we hit restart, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I think the truth is that no matter who wins in November, um, the relationship's going to be complicated. Um, uh, there's no going back um, to, <coughs> to the old George H.W. Bush days, right? That, those times are gone. And so I have to constantly tell myself, you can't live in those days, right? You have to think about what common German-American interests are now, right? That have nothing to do with Ronald Reagan or George H.W. Bush or even George W. Bush. Um, you know, it was very clear that uh, I think, in my mind at least, um, when you looked at the demonstrations um, in Berlin, um, uh, when we were still talking about TTIP, that there were going to be huge challenges getting TTIP through in Germany, also in the United States. Right? So you know, none of this is a one-sided thing. Um, I don't want to be too, you know, sort of pop psychology about it, but I, I do think that um, uh, the extraordinarily highly integrated close relationship between the United, the United States and the Federal Republic, the old Federal Republic, because it was so close and because of the pressure of the Cold War, because of all the American military forces that we had stationed in Germany over the years, and because of all the investment that was made in student exchanges and college exchanges and, and expert exchanges and all these things, right? We created um, a relationship that simply was not gonna survive the addition of the five new states and the and and be the same in the new federal republic. It just was never going to be the same. Mm -hmm. um, I would argue that we made the mistake, and this isn't Republican or Democratic, it's just the way it is. Um, I think we in the United States have failed very badly um, in investing in uh, those kinds of kinds of bilateral exchange programs that we used to invest so much in. Um, but, you know, after September 11th, so much of our focus shifted to another part of the world, and it was perceived that Europe was, you know, didn't need it anymore, right? But now we're paying the price for that. I talk to young people in Slovakia, you know, I'm going to be in Bratislava probably between now and Christmas, and the things that I hear them say um, about the bilateral relationship, about the transatlantic relationship, are just like mystifying to me, right? And the only place where it's worse is in Germany. Um, and I, I, as an example, I, I only point out that series of articles in Dish Book uh, about this town in the north central United States um, uh, and, and why people were voting for Donald Trump, right? And it was a series, I think it was seven articles in Dish Book, right? Which is a serious journal, right? I think most people would say, right? Um, turned out they were all fake. Yeah. And they got printed in Der Spiegel because it's fit the editorial narrative that the magazine wants to sell about the United States. And that's not just about Donald Trump, that's about the relationship with the US. Um, so I think we've got lots of trouble ahead uh, in that relationship, no matter who's in charge. Um, and we have to find more ways to invest in it, particularly among young people. And in my world, that means young among, among young people in politics. Whether it's you know whether it's party to party or parties in, in a multi-party format up and across the Atlantic, we need to get more young Americans who are entering politics uh, from the hinterland, um, you know, the big middle of the country to Germany, and more young German political party leaders to the United States. Right? We're not all going to like everything. It's back to those ten things again. Right? Sometimes you're going to find your biases reconfirmed. We haven't. Right? Um, but. We we have we have we have, we have so little common starting point now for a discussion that I don't even know where you where you start. Right. Drives me crazy. Okay, uh, I think the point has come. There's uh, lots of people who want to thank you very very much for uh, you for this, this anytime uh, for discuss and for lots of people see me again. It really was a pleasure. Uh, Pleasure of following your speech and your discussions. Uh, yeah, in between Bratislava and Vienna to European capital. Indeed, I see. It's an old uh, former capital city. 
Hugo from France in the town. Canutum is uh, the former capital of Upper Canaria. Yeah. You know? So that is really is uh, a very specific place due to the town, due to its geographic uh, strategic situation. And it was South Link and Road. Okay, so uh, this region is famous for best red wines in the world. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you. I love this. this we, is hope, we, hope to see, we hope to see you sometime again before we go back. I hope so. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. And <laughs>